it's good to see her. Uh, yeah, here she is, man. Here she is. Yeah, praise God. She's got to be gentle with her. Yeah, I know everybody wants to hug her, you know, but she's still recovering. <laughs> she's like, you can hug me. Yeah. Oh, praise God, man. Well, it's been a decade or more since he lost his best friend. Everything that they dreamed about had come to pass. God had accomplished everything he said he would. But one thing was missing from the picture. Jonathan. The one who saw in David a king. The king of God's choosing before anybody else recognized him. You remember when Samuel went to anoint the next king of Israel, God sent him to Jesse and to anoint one of Jesse's sons, and Samuel was going to anoint the wrong son. He was looking with man's eyes. And God's like, I don't look with man's eyes. I see the heart. He would have mistaken him. Jonathan recognized the king in David before anybody else did. And in that moment, Jonathan took off his royal garments and put them upon the shepherd boy who had slew the giant. And in that moment, he loved David as his own soul, for their souls were knit together. They were one of a kind. Jonathan recognizing the king in David, for Jonathan was the son of a king, the eldest son, the one who was to inherit the throne. But Jonathan knew he would not, for God had rejected his father Saul, because Saul had disobeyed God and did not listen to his word. Saul had led the people into trouble. Saul, having opportunities to conquer their enemies, did not, for he was too distracted with his own desires, his own agendas. And Jonathan knew that God had rejected his father Saul, and therefore the house of Saul. And Jonathan knew that God had called David to be the next king, even though he was the rightful heir. And this is to the credit of Jonathan. And Jonathan had been David's greatest supporter. If you've been with us throughout the series of 1 Samuel, he's been David's greatest supporter and friend, best friend loyal friend. He desired, his heart's desire was to stand by David and make David king, even though it was his by right. He wanted to see David made king over Israel, and he, and he wanted to be there. But he was not. For in the fighting against the Philistines, Saul and his sons were killed because of Saul's disobedience again. Now, years later, David's on the throne. He's at his peak of power and influence, and he remembers a promise he made, a promise to a friend, a promise he intended to keep. And though Jonathan is long dead, David remembers his friend and his promise. For David serves the promise-keeping God. And David is intent on being a man who keeps his promises as well, despite the cost, despite what others may say about him doing it. So we are coming to 2 Samuel chapter 9 this morning. And the last two chapters, we've seen the promise-making God and the promise-keeping God. We've learned from watching David to pray back the promises of God and then to walk in the promises of God, knowing that he will accomplish what he said he would. And David, floored by the promises of God, said, God, accomplish them. And then he walked in them and conquered every enemy on all their sides. And the people had rest on all sides, just as God said they would. And now in their rest, in David's rest, he now emulating God, desires to fulfill a promise of his own. And not simply fulfill it, but to go above and beyond in fulfilling it, to fulfill it in a way and in a manner of how God has fulfilled his promises to David. 
above and beyond how God fulfills his promises to us today. What are the promises of God? What are the covenants of God? Why does he make them? Why why did the best of friends, Jonathan and David, make a covenant together? Why do husbands and wives make the marriage covenant together? Making vows to each other, intentions by the giving and the receiving of rings. They are utterances of love, of faithfulness, of devotion. God makes his covenant with us of his own free will, and he seals it by the body and the blood of Jesus Christ, his only son. And our Lord Jesus freely gave it. And the Apostle Paul says of this in 2 Corinthians 1.20, he says, For all the promises of God find their yes in him. Speaking of Christ. That is why it is through him that we utter our amen to God for his glory. God's promises of forever love and eternal life find their yes in Jesus. It's not what anybody expected. That God would come in the flesh, the only Son of God would walk among us, experiencing the blood, sweat, and tears of this world, the trials, the tribulation, the temptations of this world, and then overcoming them all, even unto death itself, and then he overcome, he overcame death, so that he could pave the way for us as well to come, to receive new life, to be forgiven, that we would receive his righteousness not of our own, but of him, and that would well up to eternal life. So David now is going to emulate his Savior, just as we are called to emulate our Savior. He's going to do the unexpected in 2 Samuel chapter 9, beginning in verse 1. And David said, Is there still anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness For Jonathan's sake. To any reasonable person at this time that David asked this question, this is a bizarre question. It was customary in those days for the kings to utterly destroy the dynasty of the old king that they replaced, if that were to happen. Because otherwise, that old dynasty would continue to be a threat to the new king. And so it was customary to go and kill all their family. And especially considering Saul's treatment of David, it would not be a surprise for David to go and wipe out Saul's family. Consider this. David wants to show kindness to the family of the man who threatened his very existence and who seems to have caused the death of all of David's close family, just about his mother, his father, all but one of his brothers, for they were in hiding in the land of Moab because of Saul, and they never came out. And here's David saying, I want to show the house of Saul kindness. We need to understand this in context, man, and, and, and think about it. How do we apply this to our lives? Because this is the man after God's own heart, is it not? This is the man of God's choosing to be king over Israel, and the king of God's choosing shows kindness and mercy to those who, for all intents and purposes, are his enemies. The people asked for a king like all the other nations, and that's what they got with Saul. It is. Who ruthlessly killed anyone he suspected of disloyalty, even a whole town of priests, if you remember that. And anyone who, who was a threat to his political power, he sought after like David. But with David, they're getting a king that is totally unique and strange. And unlike the kings of the world, he is a king that seems to be not of this world. David went against the principle of revenge and against the principle of self-preservation and asked, what could he do for the family of his enemy? Is this what our leaders are doing today? This would be just as strange a question today as it was then. And see how our polarized political powers affect our entire culture There is a great kindness vacuum, is there not? There is a coldness, there is a 
suspicion. Love is absent. The love of many has grown cold. And this is what Jesus said the last days will look like. We each have a choice to be caught up in the fire or to resist its appetite to destroy our enemies and instead, as the king of Israel does, show mercy. It is a kingly thing to do. Well, it is a kingly thing of God's own choosing to do. King David exemplifies this in a big way here. And why does he do it? Number one is because David never thought of Saul as his enemy. He never thought of Saul as his enemy, even though Saul saw David as his. And number two, David made a promise. Even though the one he made the promise to is dead, saying that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake, for the sake of my best friend, the sake of the son of King Saul, mighty and righteous Jonathan, also David's brother-in-law, well, until Saul gave Michal away to another man to be married. And yet David still honors Saul. And he desires to show him kindness to anyone left from the house of Saul. And he wants to do it for Jonathan's sake, for the sake of their promise, their covenant. The Hebrew word here for kindness used is hesed. And it's, it's, it's used a lot in the Old Testament, almost 250 times. It's often translated as mercy, kindness, and loving kindness. Uh, when translated as, as kindness here in 2 Samuel 9, it's often referring to this type of loyal love, a godly love, a merciful love. And it's the love that Jonathan invokes of David in their promise. It is the loyal love of promise keeping, a loving kindness that does not fail and continues on after death. Remember back in 1 Samuel chapter 20, verse 14 through 15, Jonathan makes a covenant with David. Remember these best friends. He said, if I am still alive, show me the steadfast love. There it is. Show me the hesed, the steadfast love of the Lord, that I may not die, and do not cut off your steadfast love from my house forever. When the Lord cuts off every one of the enemies of David from the face of the earth, Jonathan knew this was going to happen. And Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, May the Lord take vengeance on David's enemies. And Jonathan made David swear again by his love for him, for he loved him as his own soul. And then later on in 1 Samuel 20, verse uh, 42, then Jonathan said to David, go in peace because we have sworn both of us in the name of the Lord, saying the Lord shall be between me and you and between my offspring and your offspring forever. So David and Jonathan made a covenant to not cut off his hesed, his steadfast love from Jonathan's house forever. Jonathan knew that God would fulfill his promises to David and make him king and cut off all of, his, all of his enemies from before him. And Jonathan hopes to be there, to be by David's side when this happens. To be his biggest supporter. But it was not to be. So now, God has accomplished his promises. David has rest from all, all of his enemies. As Jonathan said, the Lord has indeed taken vengeance on the enemies of David. And David, remembering the words of his friend, who encouraged him always, even coming to him, if you remember from 1 Samuel, coming to him, when David was discouraged, he was despairing, he was afraid, and Jonathan found him in hiding from his father Saul, and he came to David, and he encouraged him, take heart, David. God will accomplish his promises. David remembers his friend, he remembers the words of his friends. God will accomplish his promises. God's got this. And he sees that it has come to pass. It has come to pass. And he thinks probably in his mind, wow, only, if only my best friend Jonathan were here to see all that God's done. <laughs> if only he were here. And then remembering the covenant between them, David seeks to honor it. And show kindness, the promised kindness to the house of Saul. Verse 2, now there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. And they called him to David. And the king said to him, are you Ziba? And he said, I am your servant. And the king said, is there not still someone of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God to him, the hesed of God? I love that. This is a godly love. David is going to keep his promise to Jonathan, but not simply do the bare minimum. 
he is going to show the kindness of God, the kindness that David knows so well, the kindness that goes above and beyond, the type of kindness and mercy that floors you because of its generosity. Let's keep reading. Ziba said to the king, there is still a son of Jonathan. He is crippled in his feet. He's crippled in his feet. We've heard that before, haven't we? Actually, we heard it in 2 Samuel chapter 4, verse 4. We read, Jonathan, the son of Saul, had a son who was crippled in his feet. He was five years old when the news about Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel, and his nurse took him up and fled. And as she fled in her haste, he fell and became lame, and his name was Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth. He was five years old when he became crippled, five years old when his grandpa and his dad were killed in battle. We don't know exactly how long it's been since that point. We know it's at least been like seven and a half years since David's become king over all Israel. It's probably been many years after that because later on in this chapter we'll see Mephibosheth has a, a young son. So Mephibosheth is likely in his early 20s at this point. But notice here that David has to ask, like, is there still someone in the house of Saul? He's not sure. He's not sure. And, and anyone from Saul's house would be in hiding <laughs> because of fear. Fear of being killed. Fear of being a threat to the new regime. Because we read that Ishbosheth waged a war against David, who was Mephibosheth's uncle. So there was tension in the land. Mephibosheth had a claim to the throne, a strong one. He was the firstborn son of the firstborn son of Saul. And all other potential heirs were dead. In a, in a political sense, truly, David could have seen Mephibosheth as a rival and a threat. But he's the son of Jonathan. And he's crippled. And David sees not a rival in Mephibosheth, but he sees an unkept promise to his best friend. Verse 4 goes on, the king said to him, where is he? And Ziba said to the king, he is in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel at Lodabar. He didn't even have his own house. He was totally dependent on another, young and disabled. Verse 5, then King David sent and brought him from the house of Machir, the son of Amiel at Lodabar, and Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face and paid homage. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, Behold, I'm your servant. This is an incredible scene. Mephibosheth prostrating himself before David, submitting before him, saying, Behold, I'm your servant. It is not unlike the moment when we come before the king of kings who calls us by name. And when we come humbly before him, in submission before him, he receives us. And David's response to Mephibosheth's prostrating himself before him is not unlike God's response to us. Verse 7 goes on, and David said to him, Do not fear, for I will show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land of Saul, your father, and you shall eat at my table always. You see, it was for Jonathan's sake that David shows Mephibosheth kindness. And it's for Christ's sake that God shows to us immeasurable kindness to us poor and wretched humanity. We were enemies of God, weren't we? But we've now been made whole. We've been made new. We've been forgiven because of the cross of Christ and Mephibosheth rightly floored by the loving kindness of God, a, a, a kindness, the loving kindness of David, right? a kindness that is not of this world. It's a kindness of God, a kindness that fully restores. Mephibosheth here goes from death to life, and he goes to life abundant. He goes from crippled and in hiding and in disgrace to now being rich, Rich in land, in life abundant, rich in honor, rich in love. David draws Mephibosheth close. 
telling him, you will eat at my table always. As a full-fledged son, Mephibosheth will partake of the king's table just as Christ made us sons and daughters. And it's a humbling thing, the kindness of God. We see it here from David. Who can I show the kindness of God to? We read on what Mephibosheth did. Verse 8, and he paid homage and said, what is your servant that you should show regard for a dead dog such as I? Mephibosheth, he's like, who am I? Why would you show such regard for me? And we too in Christ, we've been given a new identity. We belong to the Most High. We're invited to dine with Him and He with us. Who are we that He has such regard for us? And not just regard, but He loves us so. He loves us so. He cares for us. Who are we that He would clothe us with His righteousness, His garments? All of our good deeds, we read, are but filthy rags compared to the goodness of God. And he gave us his covering freely. We've been made clean. There's no mistaking the parallels here in 2 Samuel chapter 9. And David's not done yet. Verse 9 goes on. Then the king called Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, so Ziba, Saul's servant, but he was. He says, all that belong to Saul and to all his house I have given to your master's grandson. And you and your sons and your servants shall till the land for him and shall bring in the produce that your master's grandson may have bread to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, shall always eat at my table. Your master's grandson. He says it three times to remind Ziba of his obligation to care for the house of Saul. And now David, in one decree, has made Mephibosheth independently wealthy, self-sufficient, having servants to tend the farm and to bring in the produce, and he gets to eat at the king's table. And he's got a very capable operating manager in Ziba. For we read on, now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. So Ziba is very capable of doing all that David asked of him. Verse 11, then Ziba said to the king, according to all that my lord the king commands his servant, so will your servant do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. We just just need to stop there and consider that. We've been invited to eat at the king's table as one of his sons, one of his beloved daughters. Verse 12, and Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all who lived in Ziba's house became Mephibosheth's servants. So Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem, for he ate always at the king's table. Now he was lame in both feet. He's in Jerusalem at the king's table. He shouldn't be there. For so many reasons, he shouldn't be there, but he is. Why? Because the king made a promise. God made a promise to you. He's calling you by name, Mephibosheth. And if we come as Mephibosheth comes before David in humility, in submission, the Lord has plans to restore us to restore everything, and not just to take us back to what it was like in the Garden of Eden with Adam. No, he's going beyond that. He's making a new heaven, a new earth, a new Jerusalem. He will dwell with us. He will be our light, be our life, be our everything. He says, come and dine with me. Come and eat at my table forevermore. Yes, indeed, we are not worthy. We are not, we are spiritually blind. We are spiritually deaf and lame and corrupt, but he says, I have redeemed you. I have bought you with the highest price imaginable, that no matter your shortcoming, I have overcome it beyond comprehension. You cannot know the cost of his son's life. We cannot comprehend 
the preciousness and the cost of the blood of Christ that he willingly shed for us, he freely gave for us, so that he can call us by name and invite us to eat with him and call us his friends. And we then have options, just as Mephibosheth had options. Some would say, you know, what options do we have? In Christ, he has the words of life and salvation. Where else would we go? And indeed, you would be right to say that. But people are endlessly creative in, in, in their reasons for rejecting the call of Christ. Think of it just with Mephibosheth. He could have rejected David's kindness out of his own pride and said, I don't need your pity, David. I don't need your help. I don't need your charity. I'll be fine on my own. Mephibosheth could have rejected David's kindness out of his own self-righteousness, couldn't he? Saying, David, I, I know you, David. I know you claim to love God. How many people have you killed, David? How many people have you murdered? I won't be safe with you. I'll be fine. I'll be better off on my own by refusing your offer of help. Could have become self-righteous, couldn't he? Mephibosheth, he, he could have started a rebellion against David. Perhaps playing the wolf in sheep's clothing, entering in, eating at the king's table, and then secretly conspiring with Ziba to start a rebellion against the king and to overthrow David, as if that were possible. Even still, Mephibosheth could have ran away from the very beginning, never coming out of hiding, too afraid to even come. Mephibosheth could have doubted the word of David. Do you really mean it, David? Is this some kind of scam or a sham? Are you making a fool of me, David? I'm young, but I've seen the world. I know how it operates. I don't trust you, much less anybody else. And in Mephibosheth's rejection of the king and of the king's hesed, his steadfast love, he is right in his own mind. But he misses out. He misses out incomprehensibly. But he is right in his own mind. But what cost is that to his very soul? What joy is missed? What peace is absent? What relationship is missed by refusing to dine at the king's table? At the king's table, everything was taken care of. Mephibosheth, the only thing he had to do was come to receive it. And everything would be provided for him. That's the deal. Come and receive it. Be restored. Be redeemed at the king's table. What is this king like? He's the one who keeps his promises. When all other promises fail, when the world is bleak and without hope, he is the promise keeper. He is the one who died for his friends to keep his promises of redemption. He is the king who sends his invitations out far and wide to any and all who would receive it and come to the table, the wedding banquet, to dine with him. But many are too busy. Many are too distracted. Many have better things to do. They'll come later. Next year, a few years down the road, I'll come. Oh, we don't, tomorrow's not guaranteed. Which is why our Lord says, today is a day of salvation. Today is a day to come to the king's table, to be restored. And for those who have come, the invitation is to do as Mephibosheth and, have, and as David does, to do as our Lord and Savior did. What has he done for us? John writes in 1 John 4, 19, we love because he first loved us, and he invites us to join him in his love, his loving kindness, his hesed his mercy, his steadfast love. He is the king who says in Luke 14, our true king, he says, but when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. Was Jesus referring to our chapter this morning in 2 Samuel chapter 9, 
I think many Jews at that time would have, would have thought back to this passage, would have thought back to this statement, this scene between Mephibosheth and David. This chapter emphasizes and reemphasizes that Mephibosheth is lame in both feet. It says it twice in case you missed it the first time. He is in no way capable of repaying David's hesed. And yet David gives him land, food, workers, honor, and love because he promised he would. So listen, we've been invited to the king's table this morning. We have to dine with him to eat with him. And I want to give you the opportunity to respond to the invitation. To say, God, I I want to be part of your family, your forever family. I want to be part of that. And what a joy that is. What a joy. And for those who've already, man, belong to that, man, this is a time for you to, to remember that. He says, those who will open the door, I will come in and dine with them. And they with me. And that's what we get to do. So here at KCC, we, I mean, we say it's as simple as the ABCs. The ABCs. Which is to admit that we're in need of a Savior. They admit that we are, we are the deaf, the blind, the crippled, the spiritually corrupt. We need someone to help us. And that person is Jesus. And to be, believe on him that he died and rose again. He came in the flesh and he rose again. And he says, because I live, you also will live. And see, there's two C's. It's to confess him as Lord and to choose to follow him all the days of your life. So I'll give you the opportunity this morning to do that. So would you bow your heads with me? We're gonna go to God in prayer together. And this is, this is for you. I wanna pray for you, but I wanna know who I'm praying for. If there's anybody here who, who says, I want to join the king at the king's table, man. I, I need Jesus in my life to restore me. As David restored Mephibosheth, Christ desires to restore you. If that's you, man, let's invite you. All our heads are bowed, eyes are closed, just to raise your hand so I know who I'm praying for this morning. Who wants to come receive? Amen. Praise God, I see that. Praise God. Our Father, we come before you as those who are sinners in need of a Savior. We confess our sins, Lord, and we repent. We come humbly in submission to you, Lord, casting ourselves upon your mercy, your steadfast love, and that you are the one who forgives. You are faithful to forgive us of all our trespasses. So, Lord, we come to you confessing, seeking your mercy. We believe on you, Lord, that you came, you died, and you rose again. You've given us new life. You've given us your spirit. You say, this is a down payment. This is your inheritance. It's a foretaste of what is to come. So, God, we receive you. We receive your spirit anew. You can remake us into your sons and daughters that we would dine at your table today. We praise you. We choose you. We confess you as Lord. We pray all these things in our mighty King Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing our closing song together in response. surround me